have led us to such a today to try to understand the power of the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, both in the Menorah as well as in the Beit HaMikdash and Yushalayim. So to open the subject, I'd like to point out, as we've done in so many shows, that the Nora is the, hidden, the open symbol and the hidden symbol of many different aspects of the spiritual dimension of the Torah, of the new Ketuvim, and of Jewish life. If we turn now turn to the last verse from last week's Pasha, in the Pasha of so it says, When Moshe came to the tent of meeting to speak with Hashem, with him, he heard the voice, Mida Berela, was speaking, it's not the usual word for speaking, but it spoke Me'ala Kaporet from the top of the cover, which was over the Aron Ha'idut, over the Ark of Testimony between the two chariots, and he spoke with him. And then follows the beginning of next week's Pasha, straight afterwards, that uh, Moshe told us to tell Aaron, Barot Chai Tanirot, when we lift up the lamps, El Mul Paneham Norah, then opposite the face of the menorah, Yairo Sheba Tanirot, so the seven lamps should bring light. And Aaron did so, opposite the face of the menorah, he raised up the lamps and the Shem command. So we have it following. Why is the ark called the ark of testimony, of truth? And also, the middle lamp of the menorah, or called the sun, the western lamp. The wick was turned towards the covering of the Holy of Holies, which covered over the ark of the covenant, also known as the ark of proof. And as the, 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 the subject of kindling the menorah in one way or another has seven passages in the Chumash to correspond to the concept of seven, which is closely related to the menorah. So, if we go into this more deeply, we see here a deep symbolism. The sages also say, why is it called Aron? Aron is a word related to the word awe, because the light of the world comes from what was contained in that ark. What was contained there? The Sefer Torah, later, and the tablets of stone, which contain the Decalogue. And why is it proof? So the sages say, what is the significance of the proof? And the proof is mentioned in connection with the ark itself and in connection with the middle lamp of the menorah where the flame was directed towards the Holy of Holies. He says, It is proof to all inhabitants of the world that the Divine Presence rests amongst Amisha. No. What, what, what was the special proof, that the Moro says, because the amount of oil which was put into the lamps, into the six lamps, was to last for the night. In the middle lamp, or the lamp, the lamp we're referring to, the one that turned to the Holy of Holies, the same volume of oil was put in to last just for the night. But there was a miracle from the time of the sanctuary and the whole time of the first temple and the second temple period until the death of Shimon Tzadik, who was the high priest, our great saint, and one of the remnants of the men of the great assembly, until that time, there was a miracle. A miracle which was a miracle for all the inhabitants of the world, that divine presence rests amongst the people of Israel. And what was it? That here there was oil, enough for the night, and it kept on burning. It bur burnt 
throughout the day in order to allow Aaron, if you ever followed him, the high priest or the other priest, to go and keep, because it says frequently, there's got to be a constant light without interruption. So to keep the light burned without interrupt, interruption. So what did they do? They went and lit the other lamps from the light, not from a new, from the light that remained burning for double the time. That was a miracle. The question is, was this miracle seen by all the inhabitants of the world? Well, surely not. Was it seen by all the people of Israel? Yes. How could they see it? You just know, where was this lamp? It was in a place called the Kodesh, the Holy. You know, if you today, I'm sure all of you have been along the tunnel, under the Kotel. As we would say, behind the Kotel, the Shekhin is still there today. You mean the place where the Beit HaMikdash is, we assume the Shekhin is still there. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prophecy mentioned already thousands of years ago, that, that will continue until today. So if you go under the tunnel, You'll see it says there, this section of the tunnel is opposite the Azara, Mulha Azara. What's the Azara? Kutu, the courtyard of the temple. You go a bit further and it says, Mul Hahichal Kodesh, opposite the holy place, which is what? It's an it's a innermost part of the temple, which couldn't really be seen by all people who were standing in the courtyard, what was going on there exactly. You could see a little bit, those who stand, stood near, 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 near the porch that led to it. But those who stood at the back, and certainly other people in Shalim, could not see what was happening with the flames. Couldn't see it. So we've got to try to understand what does all this mean? So the answer is like this. And really the answer is given to all this, is given to some extent in the Haftarah of next week, of two, next week's Pasha. So, it's like this. We have a basic principle, which we've clarified frequently, that there's a hidden language in the Tanakh, which is gradually being uncovered today by all, all circles of people who deal with analyzing the Bible, which is so different to ordinary literature. And that is, there's a numerical system and we know it starts with the first chapter of the Chumash, which is the menorah. Shabbat in the six days is really the pattern of the menorah, as we often explain. So, the our, our concept is that the, the number six is the number that refers to the six-sided world of space, material world has six sides, six directions. Today, in normal literature, we call it three dimensions. Three dimensions is six sides, the same thing. Three dimensional world, that is the six days, which is called Sheisha Chemea Mase. It's six days of concrete creation. And then the seventh day, Shabbat Lashem Elokeo. The seventh day is the abstract. And the truth is that even in our knowledge of the world around us, as anyone who's uh, ever analyzed epistemology, which is theory of knowledge, that the true world, as has been recognized gradually by, by people who took different ideas, they took them originally from the Bible, from the wisdom of Shlomo, or from other sources, then they recognize that the world is made of a numinal world and a, phen and a world of phenomena. Phenomena is the external world. But in science, we know this already today, everybody knows, the concrete world has slipped through the meshes of the scientific net. In other words, that the true world is not the world as we see it. Even, let's say, the true table, which is in front of us, which is very concrete. But the truth is that the true table is not what I see. It's not what I feel. Because a person can only see certain sides of the table. The true table is the picture I make in the abstract in my mind. That is the true table. It goes much further, but the true table is not really made of solid. We know the solid is it's really uh, sub, in the subatomic world. It's, it's, it's a world of energy that shows itself in a concrete form to the human senses. 
but underneath it's something else. So this is, everybody knows this with regard, let's say, to motion. We think we're sitting still, but the truth is we're not. In the world of concrete senses, we feel that we're sitting still, just like now. I feel, and I know the table is not just what I see. It's a combination which I have in my mind to, to put together the separate impressions on my eyes. I've looked for underneath, look from all sides, it's got six sides, not just, not, not just a, a one-dimensional world, a three-dimensional world. Six. So this is the concept of the six and the seven. Seven really means, Shavatri Natash, the power of the mind, which the human being has been given, is a certain reflection, of the mind of the universe. And science is trying to discover more and more about the mind of the universe. The mind of the universe is the creator, constantly creating the world from a non-material level to a material level. And that's what, that's therefore the, what the seven represents the power of Hashem, the power of the Creator in all human affairs. And this is the inner light of the menorah. Also, even the Sheshin what is, the, what is the Holy of Holies? That is beyond the seven. That is the power of Hashem beyond nature, beyond time and space, beyond human thought. That's the eighth dimension. So therefore, the, 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 when, when, the, when, when this is put forward, it says here, this the words of the sages, that it's called Eidos, it's proof that the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, rests amongst the people of Israel, the Arona Eidot, this is the Torah Shibitav, the source of inspiration, and the, the, the kindling of the lights is the way in which the greatest sage of the people of Israel, which is re represented by the Kohanim, even the rest of the people go astray, they have to try to keep up this power, and if they're not keeping up the power, it's got to be kept by the greatest sages of the time, and they have to transform the hidden light which is contained in the written Torah and to put it into practice and to show people how to observe it in the concrete world. That is the Kondolot Trenda. How do we know this is the meaning? We'll go to turn, turn straight to the Haftarah. If you turn the Haftarah, what is it? It's the fourth chapter of Zechariah. You might ask, what has that really got to do with the kindling of the menorah in the Beit HaMikdash? Well, if you analyze this Haftarah, it's got a lot of questions attached to it. Surely, the prophet Zechariah, he knew what the menorah was. And then in the dream, what did he see? If you look here in, 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 in uh, chapter 4, of the um, beginning of chapter 4 of Zechariah, in the Haftarah, it says that An angel spoke to me in a dream. When did Zechariah live? Do any of you know? When did he live? Before the At the beginning of the building of the second temple. And as you know, most Jews remained in Babel, other places of dispersion, the ten tribes had become lost. But Korash gave permission to the Jewish people, you go and build your temple. That was the main goal. Build your temple, and then you can go back and establish the second commonwealth. And they had many difficulties, because there were many other nations who had taken hold of different parts of the land of Israel, and uh, they tried to stop it. In addition to that, when, it, when, they, when, when, they, when, they, when they started the second Beit HaMikdash, not only that difficulties, and they didn't quite know how they were going to succeed in completing the Beit HaMikdash, but even after they built up the Beit HaMikdash, there were many problems they had to face, not only from non-Jews, not only from the, from, from, first from some, some of the Sumerians and some of the Samaritans, from Berlin, but also even from Jewish groups that did not believe in the oral tradition, just as the Sadducees, and even the Essenes, 
they, they try to introduce their own cults. But they, they all, they all these cults that, that arose even amongst the Greeks, they did appreciate the written text. In fact, it's known the success of Alexander the Great. He went and had the Bible translated into Greek. But the oral tradition they did not know about. And also, the Jews, many of them, became more assimilated. So they said, we'll just accept the written text. And that, that's the development that took place in the time of the second Beit HaMikdash culminated towards the birth of Christianity and other cults, which, which did not follow the oral tradition. So, he, what, was, what was he shown here? He was shown a golden menorah, made entirely of gold, a bowl on its top, and had its seven lamps, and then it had seven pipes go into those seven lamps. Otherwise you already have the concept 49, 7 times 7. Then there were two olive trees on each side, one on the right of the bowl, one on the left of the bowl. So I said to the angel, I said, what are these, my master? What you, what you didn't know? He knew what the menorah was, but it wasn't the usual menorah. It was a menorah which has two olive trees on both sides. And also, it went and had seven pipes from the olive, the, the, the olive, the olive dropped into the bowl. There were seven pipes that went to the seven lamps. You know what it all meant? He, so, the, 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 so the angel said to me, what, you don't know what this means? I said, no. He, he assumed that this prophet in the dream would be on a sufficiently high level to understand what it implied. And it says, he answered me and said, this is the word of Hashem to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the political leader who tried to establish the second congress in Beit HaMikdash. And what is the message? You should not think that you will have um, success through wealth or might all different, if different physical success. Chai is an overall general expression for power, Daniel. but, okay. but special, it's a wide aspect of power, and not through military force, only through my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And therefore, never mind all the obstacles in front of the Babel to be successful and victorious, they'll all turn over to be, instead of obstacles of a high mountain that stop you making progress, it will all become a straight, plain path. And they will bring, there will be a time when you will be able to put down the Evan or Rosha, the, 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 the cornerstone, with the shouts of praise, the, we are, the, the, there's great success and great charm in, in, in store for the people of Israel. Now, see, so there's, there's what is the connection between this and the menorah in, this, in the sanctuary? This is a different type of menorah. So we see already here, we don't have to go in the Midrashim, we see in the, in the Tanakh itself, there's an explanation of the deeper aspects of the menorah and what it represents for the people of Israel. We're saying this because the state of Israel also took the menorah as a symbol. And we should know the symbol is how it would be successful if you take it quite simply, it's like this. The great period of the Second Temple was the enormous development of Hacham Adif Minavi. The, the last, Zerubbabel was one of the last prophets. The last prophets, including Malachi, Haggai, Zechai, and Malachi, the three last prophets, they were still, had some inspiration as youngsters from uh, the first Beit HaMikdash, or its immediate aftermath, and they managed to witness the beginning of the Second Commonwealth. And what was the greatness of the Second Commonwealth? It gave the ability of enormous flowering of Torah Sheba'alke, of the oral tradition. Because that was a time when the power of the Bible was recognized by the, at least the cultured nations around, and they built on it. They dealt with it. But, obviously, if you just go by the written text, it's liable to distortions. So, 
Therefore, let's take it to the simple level. The simple level is the menorah represents the oral tradition, which has to be led by the Kohanim, and if the Kohanim are not there, it's got to be led by all those who continue the tradition of the Kohanim to go and be the representatives of the Mamlechet Kohanim. To go in Yorim Shpatech Yaakov to Ratchali Israel, as it says at the end of the Chumash, Moshe Rabbeinu said, the task of the tribe of Levi is to become teachers of Torah to the rest of the nation. Doesn't mean others can also be teachers, but the other tribes, their basic mission is not exactly the same as the Levian. The Levian, which include the Kohanim, they are the ones who through their example, the model, and through their service of Hashem, and through their teaching, will keep up the elite and the real purpose of the people of Israel. And that's the con, the Levi, the, the, the company that works with the Kohanim, and the people of Israel are going to become a Mamlechet Kohanim, a kingdom of priests for the rest of mankind. So in other words, the light. In fact, if you go back, to Avram Avinu, who was also told, as I said yesterday, she was also told that his task is to bring light to the whole world. So this is the ultimate mission of the people of Israel, because there is light in the world. Unfortunately, it's neglected, it was neglected in the world of idolatry. But there was a certain aspect of the spread of the Bible, starting with Shlomo Amela, where also he had great influence upon all the nations around. And from there it crept to a bit, little bit to Alexander the Great and the Greeks, totally. So, so the Greeks also developed this light a little bit more, as was already prophesied by Noah, if you go back to history, this is what would happen, and it has happened. And if we take, we take this concept until today, we see today that the, the Bible and the Decalogue which is, in its, in its root, the Chumash, the Aron, the eighth dimension, the supernatural power which exists amongst the people of Israel, has become known amongst all the nations of the world. And it's this which you'll find all his, all his stories referred to it. Some, some like it and some dislike it. One of the greatest uh, philosophers of history, Toynbee, he had ups and downs, if you study his works. He liked it and admired it and he hated it. They have to have love-hate relationship with Jewish culture. But still, there's some who love it, and there's some who hate it. And unfortunately, this is carrying on until today. Today we have the situation that the Bible, yes, they know, but the distortions of the Bible have reached such terrible extremes that were not imaginable even in the time of the Greeks. They should be distorted to such an extent. It would start to start cruel cruelty and murder. All in the name of the Bible, yeah. the distortion of the Bible. So we see how important Torah Shabbal Peh, killing the pure light. This is the task of the people, keep the light pure. You cannot go and give over the written Bible to other thinkers to go and use as according to their emotional <coughs> um, instability. Let's call it that, at the least. Look. That's why it says, and he said the whole essence of the second temple is this. So therefore, uh, uh, first I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce this to you from a halachic aspect, just briefly. And for this, we'll go straight to the words of the Rambam. And we know the Rambam in the Moran Abuchim, he dealt with many aspects of Jewish thought. In his Mishneh Torah, which is written in the development of pure Mishnahic Hebrew. So the Rambam, he does not base his extensive philosophical discussion. And also, he, but he tries to put down basic concepts very briefly. And when he mentions Agathic passages, they have a deepest halachic significance. So we know that this uh, menorah, it expressed this, the second Commonwealth's uh, con challenges and difficulties also. Don't think that you'll be able to establish this Commonwealth on the basis of power. You can only establish it on the basis of a spiritual mission. 
namely to spread and keep alive the full power of the written Torah in its practice. And I'll add to this, in this talk, you will find the last mitzvah of the Torah to write a Sefer Torah. So we play a Sefer Torah is the eighth dimension, the hidden dimension. It's very deep. It contains many aspects of hidden light. And therefore the text is very important. So it says you've got to write the Sefer Torah. It's a great mitzvah. But we don't make a broch on it. Why not? Because the real purpose of the Torah Shebiktav, not that you should look after it and keep it in the Arona Kodesh, which is also very important, make sure that nobody shows any disrespect to it, it doesn't become destroyed, chas v'shalom, be very careful with these things, and uh, the people have to have respect for it, and we said, I'll just mention by the side, when you find the youngsters, unfortunately, who go to the general schools where they're not taught respect for the Jewish tradition, so some, who say they are the board, because they, but they, they're bored by what goes on in their schools, or in their gangs, the schools create the gangs. We know the schools are going with drugs and with weapons sometimes. And some of these boys, they went and destroyed the mezuzot. Yeah? And uh, they, I think they may be an attempt even to burn up a place. But especially when they see, you know, that in the, in the place of Anana, which is a cultured area, an area of uh, some enlightened Jews, but they permitted there to, to, for the J4J, Jewish missionaries, to go and have their affair. The area permitted it. The Ari didn't want to do it. But we had the High Court of Justice gave them permission. So they see, you know, here, here we live in a land. If you don't get Torah, then what do you get? You get corruption, you get juvenile and delinquency. What's going on here in this country? We've got to keep alive. The, what, what's, that's the, the menorah. What, what's happened to it in the, in the Jewish schools where they, where they, where they, they, want, they all they want to introduce is Tarbut, yeah, the culture of the nations around. The, the, the drug culture and the violence culture. That's the culture of the nations around today. So it's very, very, very important for us to keep alive the true Torah Shabbat affair. So this is as an aside. Now let's go into a bit deeper in terms of going back to the Rambam. The Rambam, he crystallizes in a few words sometimes very important teachings. So what does the Rambam say? What's Shechina mean? We say the Beit HaMikdash is the place of the Shechina. Even today, we say the Kotel. <coughs> when you come to the Kotel, the Shechina has not left the Kotel. <coughs> we'll see further what the Rambam says. The Rambam says in the second chapter of the Lord's concern the Beit HaMikdash, he says the altar where we bring offerings has this exact spot. and You mustn't change it from its place any time because there are many verses brought to this. And we know that in this place of the Mikdash, where the altar is, there Yitzchak, our forefather, was offered because it says, Lech Lecha Eret HaMuriah. Go to the land of Muriah. Muriah means the place where you can find the teaching of God. Moreh Ka. Well, it means it's a place from which teaching goes out to the world. True teaching, teaching how to live. And it says in Divraimim, when Shlomo began to build the Beit HaMikdash, Vayoch el Shlomo live not at Beit Hashem Yerushalayim, Baha Muriya, Asher nere le David, Aviu. He says, Shlomo built the house of Hashem Yerushalayim on the Mount Muriya, when it appeared to David, his father, because the poor David had prepared that place in the barn of Arnon the Yevusi. Now it's interesting. Yeshua came and conquered the land. And only 400 years later did he take over, almost 400 years, he took over this place to build the Beit HaMikdash without any conquest. He paid for it, full money. He re they refused to attack it. Although Yeshua went and conquered the whole. But when they conquered the whole land, and to be divided amongst all the tribes. 400 years later, they built the Beit HaMikdash, although it says all the time in the Chumash, already mentioned in the Shira Tayyam, and they mention it, Sefer Tavari, Makom HaShem Yifchar HaShem, Shaken Shmo Sham, doesn't say Yerushalayim. It says the place which Hashem will choose, there you should bring all the offerings, and all the offerings to be brought in the temple are described in the Chumash. And 
And David, David couldn't, couldn't, but not like, David, you, you can't conquer it. You can only do it through treaty, through, through um, peaceful ways. He bought it, just like Abraham Avinu had bought Hebron for the people of Israel. So David Amel knew he had to buy the Hamuria for the people of Israel. And then the Ramah continued, it's a tradition in the hand of all that the place where David and Shlomo planned and just Shlomo actually built the altar, that is the place, exact spot, where Avram Avino offered up his son, and the same place on which Cain and Hevel had the offerings. And also the same place where Adam Arishon, when he's created, brought an offering. And from there, the world was created. So therefore, oh, from there, sorry, there, from there, man was created. Sham Nifa. Adam Arishon was created from that spot, the Amuria. The sages say, Adam Imakon Kabrato Nifa. Man was created from the place where he can gain atonement, from the altar. So the Rambam, the Rambam introduces this, means he's accepting this as a lucky concept. That the place right from the beginning where Adam Arishon was already dedicated as a place of holiness. That's great significance. And then he, he said also, also Noah. Yeah. Also Noah left out. Noah also built his altar there when he came up from the ark. That's the Mizbeah where Kain Hera put the offerings. So on the basis of this, we can understand, which everybody asks, from the Rambam in the sixth chapter of the laws concerning the temple. And there he says something of great significance to us today. But we know there, 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 there's a, a, at the moment there are also different uh, political groups that believe it's good for us to go on the Temple Mount. So we'll see what's the Rambam's view. The Rambam is really the major prosec in, in all these matters. And the Rambam is a deep concept behind all this. <coughs> and since this is a moot point, and it's very important that we should realize the risks that are being taken by the politicians who don't listen to the Gdolei Torah. So it's, it, it has its great importance. Now, halachically speaking. The, and, to understand, and to understand the halachic, that's why I quoted from this, the first chapter of the laws concerning the temple. Now, in the sixth chapter, the Rambam says as follows. He says that we should know that the, there's a way in which Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came to build the second temple, and in the second temple time, he says there was no king, there was no Urim Vitumim, no divine oracle, so how did it become holy? How can you make holiness when you haven't got a king? In fact, the sages, there were five matters missing. The Rambam says that the temple was sanctified in a full manner by King Shlomo, where he sanctified the courtyard as well as Israel for its time, and he sanctified it for the whole future. Therefore, the Rambam says, one can bring offerings even though there's no temple built. One can eat the Holy of Holies throughout the courtyard even though the temple is destroyed and not surrounded by its walls. You can eat ordinary Kodashem and Masashemi in the Holy Yushalayim even though there's no wall around Yushalayim. Why? Because the first holiness introduced to the temple. Like King Solomon was for its, for its own time and for all future times. It's why do I say this about the Mikdash and Yerushalayim? Why do I say the Holy Temple in Yerushalayim 
that it exists forever. And the rest of Eretz Israel, when it comes to the seventh year, and when it comes to Maaser, then what was sanctified in Eretz Israel in the time of Shlomo, where the extent of the land was from Eilat right through the Golan, and even further, this very large area became sanctified. He said, because the holiness of the Beit HaMikdush and Shalim is not dependent upon the sanctity of the whole of Eretz Israel. It's on the account of the Shekhinah. And the Shekhinah never become nullified. And he brings a puzzle from a passage we read a few weeks ago, where it describes what will happen when the Beit HaMikdush will be destroyed. Vashimoti et Mikdusheichem. Much more in the plural. I'm going to just make desolate your holy places. And the sage, what does that mean? Even though the place of the Beit HaMikdash, where it stood, is now desolate, there's no Beit HaMikdash. And Shualim Hilchuba, some say Shualim are the sly Arabs, who make promises to keep them. You can watch what they do on the slide. Even they, they've taken hold of it. It still has its holiness. That's, that's, that's the Kedusha Yushalayim is a Shechina. The Shechina is in Yushalayim, Kudram. It's in the, in the, at least in the area of the old Yerushalayim. And certainly in the place of the Mikdash. Certainly in the Harabai. But he of Haaretz, but as far as the land is concerned, with regard to the Shemitah, and with regard to Masa, this is on account of Kibbutz Shababim. This is because it was taken in possession by many, by the, by the people, by the community of Israel. And once, so Kim Shilkhaz be there, since the land which was conquered by the many under Yeshua, it was took by conquest. So, as a result, when the conquest ceased, and the land was conquered by, first by Sanchele, the ten tribes, northern kingdom, then afterwards even the southern kingdom, the Beit HaMikdash, everyone was conquered with Kodetza, and the land was made desolate, so the land remained desolate. And therefore, since it was conquered, accepted through conquest, when the conquest was conquered by the other nations, then it became nullified. But what happened? After 70 years came Ezra, and Ezra re-sanctified the land. But how did he re-sanctify it? He didn't conquer it. No, it was given. At that time, you can say the Persian Empire was such that it contained near the whole of the Middle East. And he gave permission. In fact, he said he gave support. Please go back and build the Beit HaMikdash. And he gave help, call it. The end of the end of the Tanakh, the end of the Bayamid. And uh, he said, okay, so whatever Ezra took back, and uh, he went and settled the Jews that came with him, which is the minority of the Jews, but all around Yerushalayim. So he said, because uh, therefore the rule is, call Akom Shirziko Oli Babel, those who came from Babylon to took over Eretz Israel. So any place that they took hold of with the Chazakah, it Kadesh, it got a second Kedusha. And second Kedusha remains until the future. Means now as well. Second Kedusha is there. And even though the land was taken away from them since then, it still has the duty for Sri Yudha Masrot, Minat Torah. Because the Kedusha of Sri and Nasa is in those areas that were occupied by the Second Temple period but they were much less than the larger area. That's why today in practice, it's simple, see? If you get produce today from the southern Negev, there's no dinner of Shviyas, doesn't exist. Because that, that, the Kedusha of the first temple period has disappeared. We only the Kedusha of the second temple period. So, the way that, now the Rama referred to this concept of Hilchis, of, of, of the laws of the second Beit HaMikdash area of the land of Israel, 
He referred to it a few times before, and he looked at Tumot, he looked at Shmita and Yovel. And that's why it's Shmita and Yovel. Yovel doesn't apply today, because Yovel need, need, need the majority of all the tribes. But Shmita applies. That means that the Kuhn and the Rambam, there's a din of Shmita in the areas which are taken over in the Second Temple period. So the question that, that so the, so the, the case of Mishnah, Beit Yosef, so he asked the following question. He says, okay, the first Beit HaMikdash was taken through conquest. And Hashem said, Yeshua, go, you have to make an army, you have to conquer the land. And as long as Am Yisrael fulfill the mitzvot, you know, so there was, they had victories. And sometimes victories didn't go so easy. And then, but only 400 years later, they could really make Kedushat Yerushalayim. But Kedushat, the rest of Eretz Israel, was done bit by bit in those 400 years, step by step. Step by step, one conquest after one battle after the other, until they were able to take over the whole land, divide amongst all the tribes, and they could get settled there. So that happened in the time of David HaMelech, because he had been involved in bloodshed, therefore he was not allowed to take part in building the Beit HaMikdash, although he already had the plan for it. And Shlomo HaMelech, Shashorah did not engage in any warfare, and he was able to, to be given the ability to make, to bring back the Shekhinah entirely. So, now the question raised by nearly all the commentators, they can't really understand, they say, what, what does the Rambam mean when he says that the land was acquired in the first Beit HaMikdash through conquest, but it was also acquired through Chazaka. Chazaka means you take hold of land, you dig it, you build it. Well, they built up the whole land. And they settled all the tribes. That was the Chazaka. Or there was also conquest, which all meant, unfortunately, also loss of life and killing and so on. But still, the, the Chazaka had it, 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 the condition of conquest. The second one was by, uh, by international agreement. Say Ezra did not have to be involved in any war of conquest. What, but what they did have to do, unfortunately, they were attacked. When they attacked, they resisted. In fact, there were attacks made to stop the whole building and also to kill, kill the Jews around Jerusalem. So they had to defend themselves. And that went on throughout the Second, second Temple period. And, and to, so to understand this, I'm now, I'm now going to this. Who are, I'm going to give you the answer given by Ruchaim Abrisk. He gave the following answer to this question. So, which is closely connected with the menorah. So, he followed so far. So, I'll, I'm going to use his own words. You know today there's Briska Yeshivas. They're all in the outflow, whether in America or here, or Ruchaim Brisk, who was one of the greatest geniuses in Talmudical understanding. So he says like this. And he does it as a commentary on the vision of Zechariah. You know, I have a, I have a, 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 perhaps you've seen pictures of it. I've, I've, I've brought it to the songs of Hanukkah, that uh, my uncle, who was one of the greatest masters of Judaica, so he also produced uh, a menorah, uh, which is in the form of an olive tree. Because the truth is, in a certain way, even the menorah of the Mishkan, as it's described, you find how that's described in our first commentary also. He says, the olive tree of the Mishkan, with its, it's got buds, it's got cups, it's really also a bit of a tree. Atirechad Pircha. The year of that's the roots, the base, is, the, is what's called the hip, the base of the menorah. And then you have all these flowers, which have deep significance. But it's like a tree. In other words, the concept of Torah Shem is growth. If you take the, the, the Sefer Torah and show the greatest honor and keep it locked up in the Rona Kodesh and never learn it, then you're not really fulfilling the go back now to the Ketivat. That's why there's no broch on writing the Sefer Torah. Why? Because the Sefer Torah is there to be expounded through the oral tradition. And when the mitzvah is given, it says, 
Atah Kitur means Hashir Azot, which is the Torah, it's like a song. It's a very deep, deep concept. The Shira is a, is a concept of the deep vision contained in the Torah. But Sima Vafir, it says you've got to put that Torah in the mouths of the people through the oral tradition. And that's the time. So if you really fulfill that mitzvah, to last, it's part of mitzvah's Talmud Torah. And that's why the Rosh, and we follow that custom, he said you could fulfill the mitzvah of purchasing the same Torah by purchasing its foreign of Torah Shibal Peh. Because the purpose of writing it is to use it as a source of inspiration, the eighth dimension, to go over in the seventh dimension, to use our human mind. And we know this also explains Hanukkah, which I, which I will just say by the way now, but there's so many aspects to this concept. Hanukkah, as the Ramban says, that Aaron complained, he says, um, if what, and all the twelve tribes, they all brought fantastic offerings to the consecration of the sanctuary. What can I do for the consecration? So, so Hashem says to them, you've got something much greater, which will exist even when there are no offerings. And that is you kindle a menorah. So the question arises, what do you mean? When there's no concert, when there's no betamik, when there's betamik, does you all the cup or not? And you can also bring the menorah. And when there's no betamikdos, or when the betamikdos becomes becomes contaminated, then um, then you can't have a menorah in the betamikdos. So 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 it's the same as same as all other offerings. Why is your part greater? So the answer is because the menorah represents. Torah Shabbat Peh. And Torah Shabbat continues throughout the ages. It's for all time. It's never lost because it is a Shekhinah. Torah Shabbat Peh brings the Shekhinah to Am Yisrael. That's so, that, so, now listen, that, that is what was described to the prophet Zechariah. We will go back to the vision of Zechariah now according to the comment made here by Ruchayim Briz based on the opinion of the Rambam on, and based on this Kashi. Kashi is if, you, why does the Rambam say, as far as Eretz Israel is concerned, he says that the first Beit HaMikdash and the holiness of the land of Israel in that period was produced through military conquest. But the, and also through Chazaka. Of course Chazaka was Chazaka. They took hold of the land. They took out, they, 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 they took out some areas, maybe they also made deals, they bought. The land went over to the 12 tribes. So therefore, it was purchased by them with, with Chazaka all the way around, much more than the time of Ezra. Ezra took a much smaller part of the land. Okay, so therefore, if we say the second Kedusha remains even up to the third Beit HaMikdash, that means the second, second Kedusha is really preparation for the third Beit HaMikdash. So therefore, if, 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 if why should that first Beit HaMikdash be any less Chazaka than the second Beit HaMikdash. So he says like this. So he says that this is exactly what Zechariah was shown here. Lo b'chai v'lo b'koach. In other words, what did he mean with this? He didn't, did not, it's difficult to even understand. I'm sure we're sure that Zechariah was sufficiently aware in his prophecy of what was happening to the Bavel. And uh, he even describes another vision that the, the Kuhuna Gedola would become contaminated. In other words, that in the second Beta Mikdas, although there's, there's one of the two olive trees, these are the two great positions amongst the people of Israel that have to be anointed with olive oil, which is the high priest and the king. They both need anointing. And the sages say there was no olive oil, there was no proper mishcha. Mishcha is the, is the, the special type of by the oil which had to be mixed with different things. It was not available in, the, in its holy level in the time of the second Beit HaMikdash. So in other words, the Malchut and the Kuna would become a bit distorted. And these were the two origins on both sides. So he said to him, but how can you retain purity through the kindling of the light? And he said there's a bit of a contradiction. How in the, the, it was, this was a prophetic dream. A simple explanation is there's nothing in this dream of nonsense which exists in other dreams. So it's a bit difficult to understand 
that he knew what it was but didn't understand it. So he says that we should know that the whole of this prophecy on the second Beit HaMikdash where he was shown the Koen Gadol, the menorah, the Beit HaMikdash and the two olive trees which are explained later in Zechariah, Bnei Yitzhak, these are the sons of the olive that is the king and the high priest who are anointed with the Shem and it's very difficult. In the Bayat Sheni there was no Shem and Amishcha. It was hidden together with the ark. There was no king either at all. And the Kohen Gadol was only one with Mrub, only the one Mrub, it wasn't one, he wasn't anointed. He, wore, he had eight clothes, eight garments, but not the anointed one. There where it says, the Rambam says explicitly, second Kiddusha is also for the future, Bet HaMikdash. In which case there will be revealed the Shem and Amishcha. And then there will be a king. Then there will be Bnei Yitzhak. There will be a holy Kohen Gadol. And there will also be a holy Melech HaMashiach on account of this. So therefore, according to Rambam, the Kedusha, the second Beit HaMikdash, is really just a starting preparation for the third Beit HaMikdash. And that's why the Rambam says as follows. We can understand now why the angel says to him, don't you know? Don't you know that when I'm showing you here the second Kedusha, and now he thought, and so he thought that the second Kedusha also requires conquest. Because uh, it's first by Mitch required it. And therefore, this, since, since the second one also requires conquest, that means we've got to establish this state now, the second, second state, the second conquest, we also have to take part in conquest. It was, he, it was the, the Rabbi had in his mind, he said, Look, the, the international agreement has been we can take back the whole of Eretz Israel. We've got a lot of opposition here. Maybe we should also engage in warfare, like the first Beit HaMikdash, which was like a command of Hashem. We also need kibbutz. So the message will no, no. This Beit HaMikdash, you forget about a war of conquest. Well, defending lives, that's what that you've got to do uh, also if it's a village. Yeah, against those who want to attack you and kill you. But, uh, but as far as the Kedusha is concerned, this time, no conquest. Gamma Kedusha So, and he said, might also say, in that case, it'll happen. If it's by conquest, then it means if in a later period we'll be conquered, for example, by the Romans, then it will be losing the Kedusha, just like the first one. Something acquired by conquest, or it disappears through conquest. But since the second Beit HaMikdash is a Beit HaMikdash which will not be acquired, the Kedusha, and the Kedusha of Eretz extends a little bit from the Kedusha of, of Israel. Therefore he says, no, these two olives, by the Kedusha, don't refer to the second Beit HaMikdash. There's no, there's no Shem and Amishra. So the Malach said, Lo b'chav l'cho, kim bruchim. You won't require kibush for the second one. And therefore, the Kadusha is one Kadusha with the third Beit HaMishkosh. And then there'll be Shem and HaMishkosh. And then there'll be, the, 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 with, this, with this prophecy, we are told it, it will come through Chazakah Bilvad, and therefore won't become destroyed. So I think this is a very important message for us today also. We, it's, it's correct and should be kept 100% the Tzahal must retain its true meaning, Tzva HaKanal Yisrael. It's only one to protect Jews. It's not there to make any form of conquest. And Chaz Shalom, going with the Ram Shitta, that anybody should take away the source of the holiness, which ultimately is the menorah and is the Harabayat. The Shechina, which represented by the menorah, is also shown in the fact that we are permitted to go on the Harabai to save lives, that's essential under the present circumstances. But what has been, what has been done, and you can see, it, it's this that causes a lot of problems. Uh, uh, it's happened in such a way that you shall lie in the Why? Because they do know from the Tanakh that it's the most holy place in the world. Even though the Muslims have got their place, the Christians have perhaps Rome, but still, 
they all regard this place as the most holy because that's as described in the in the in the Tanakh. And they don't they're not aware of the Torah Shabal Peh, which says you mustn't go on the mountain. But we Jews have to be aware of it. And we Jews, it's such a it's such a, even even from a simple political point of view, there's a rule, anyone who follows the way of the way of the Chazal all the way through the Torah Shabal Peh, when you, when they first first went into exile, Yemiyahu said, Deal so et shalom ha'il. Wherever you are, always pursue peace. And there's so many things which are instituted by the Satan, Mitachi Shalom. You've got to, Jews have to express peace. Never attack anyone to anything which disturbs the peace. And part of it is to go and provoke them, since it's forbidden. And the Chi of Koret, the Ramas turns out the Chi of Koret, the writer. The Ramas is the writer. Is any, anyone and, and if religious Jews go to certain places which they say the the temple was never here, never there, it's not so simple where the temple stood. Not so matter. And in any case, even those Jews, they go to the mikveh first and they make sure they don't wear leather in their shoes and so on. And they think they do the most holy thing. They are provoking the non-Jews to an unnecessary situation, and they bring in many non-religious Jews who as a result will say, well, if they go up, we can also go up. It's very, very dangerous. And we have to recognize that we are, we, are, we are treading on dangerous ground when anyone goes on the Temple Mount when it's not necessary. And, and the soldiers, generally speaking, they only take soldiers by the... the, the, the now this, it's, it's, it's very serious what's going on now because they're being debated and that's why I want to say in full force that, that all the real Gedolei Torah, not only of, of our day, but even Rav Kook, all the, even the, the Rabbanim of the Mizrahi, all the chief rabbis till now, have said it's strictly forbidden for any person to go up on the Temple Mount. They have to make an over, if they don't make it overall, it will certainly bring many Jews to, to transgress them. And to go and rely, some people say, well, the driver disagrees, we know, but, but in, they're not, these are not people who, 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 who in other aspects will want to fulfill the mitzvah of the driver or the heta of the driver against the Rambam and many other poskim. The Rambam, you see, the Rambam is systematic and has such comprehensive understanding. This is the most holy place in the world, and the nation and the world know it as well. So, so we have to, to, to deal with it carefully, and we have to. We have to reach Ireland. And then let's take them. It's getting late. So we'll, I just want to take this. Many other aspects of this, but I want to say that Loba Chayab Loba Kim Baruchi is very important today. Uh, the mot, there's, a, there's a certain group that has taken this verse as their motto. Do you, do you know which group it is? Who has that as their motto? It's the Hebrew University. Hmm. Their motto is Lobachayel, Lobachoach, Kim Bruach. Not with, but what does Ruach mean by without the youth? They've left out the youth. Hmm. They've changed the, the, the holiness of the Tanakh. We, with, we have a Masora. Every letter in the Tanakh is holy. And if somebody mis, misprints it, he's doing a lot of harm, especially this. There's a big difference with Ruach. Ruach means our university is there to spread um, the uh, intellectual aspect of Israel. Yeah, the, the showpiece, a great university, big professors in every different subject. This is all the Madaya Ruach, the Madaya Teva, but still, all the Madaya Teva, they more, have more, more, more professors and lecturers than Madaya Ruach. But nevertheless, this is an indication of the whole approach of the previous government to Jewish education. Yeah, they, they, they're trying to bring in Tabut Zara, they bring in, it's like this, we've got to know the purpose of the menorah, according to many, includes the seven wisdoms. Yeah, the Gaon of Vilna also speaks about this. It includes all the seven wisdoms. But the seven wisdoms all pervaded by the spirit of the Torah. And the recognition that if you really want to use any other intellectual qualities that have been developed in your education, make sure they all become tools in the preservation of 
the most important plan of life given by the creator of life, how both non-Jews and Jews are supposed to behave and live, how they're supposed to develop their souls, not just their bodies, they're, how they all created but Selim Elohim. And Elohim means the God who expresses himself in nature. And you not only you will find thousands of discoveries of science which are already met inherent in our oral tradition, going right back in many different areas, and the, the many people who studied science thoroughly <coughs> in different areas, and then they found out, for example, in the calendar and other things, that this all contained over thousands of years in Jewish tradition, they say, well, these are only discovered by science a few, a few hundred years ago, or some even a few, a shorter time ago. And there's so many areas in, in this being discovered <coughs> almost month after month, that's how, and that's how and the people like the Chazonish, for example, the greatest scholar of the previous generation, if you, start, if you go to the back of his sefer, you'll find there both astronomical and arithmetical charts by a person who never went to school. And the Vilna Gaon, he, what the knowledge of science was enormous, and he used it. And he answered problems of the biggest professor of his time in Berlin with a, with a small diagram, he answered the problems they were working on in his time. And that goes on today all the time. So we've got to know, we've got to subject science to the directive. And the, 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 the theory, instead of science today being largely abused by the politicians to create weapons of destruction, or to even to create dangerous, dangerous forms of exploration which are often involve deaths. We have to use all development in all the sciences in order to recognize the light of life is contained in the Torah. And only that will bring peace to the world. And then we've we got to show the example in our time. And by strengthening, strengthening our knowledge, knowledge of Torah and fulfillment of all the mitzvahs. Now, Mitzvah, Rabbah, Mitzvah, Rabbah, Mitzvah, Rabbah, Mitzvah, Rabbah, Mitzvah, Rabbah, Mitzvah, Rabbah, Mitzvah, Rabbah